Picture this, you're eight months into a campaign. You've been through amazing battles and heartbreaking revelations. It's become much more than just a game for you and much, much more than just a system of rules. Your character's journey is like nothing that you've ever experienced before. And then you fail your third death save. Your stomach sinks and your world goes quiet. You realize right then and there that your character's journey is over. But what if it doesn't have to be? Hello and welcome back to Lunch Break Heroes. Here on this channel, we don't want to trivialize character death. Such an event should always be momentous, especially if it happens late in a campaign to a character that you've really grown attached to. It should affect and change all of the members of the party. But once all is said and done, maybe you don't want that character to stay dead. Fun is the point of the game after all, and maybe you'd have a lot more fun by bringing that character back to life somehow. In Dungeons & Dragons, there are six spells that can bring your character back from the dead. There's Revivify, Raise Dead, Reincarnate, Resurrection, True Resurrection, and Wish. I don't want to talk about any of those today. Right now, we're going to go over five other ways that your character can cheat death, so to speak, and continue their adventuring career. Each one of these is meaningful and impactful and comes at a price. These are really well suited to Curse of Strahd and Ravenloft in general, but you can adapt them to any setting that you would like. We're going to be talking about the qualifications, the mechanics, and the drawbacks of each one of these methods. That way, you can pick and choose what is right for your character. So without any further ado, let's get started. First off, we have Becoming a Revenant. Revenants are undead creatures brought back to life by their obsession over some bit of unfinished business. They're usually angry creatures driven by their own malice and hatred for whatever it is that left a massive chip on their shoulder. In order to become a Revenant, your character has to have displayed extreme dedication bordering on the obsessive toward achieving some sort of concrete goal. That goal, in principle, has to be achievable. A lot like a paladin's powers are driven by their belief, the life force of your revenant is driven by their own convictions. So how do you do this in game mechanics? Well, first, you turn your creature type to undead. Keep your class features and your alignment. Next, drop your racial or lineage features, except languages and proficiencies. Then gain the following features. Deathless nature. You don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. Rejuvenation. When you die, your soul transfers to another humanoid corpse after 24 hours. Turn immunity. You're immune to all effects that turn undead. Becoming a revenant's not a great thing, though. I mean, you're undead for one. That's kind of gross, and it has an effect on how the game world reacts to your character. Additionally, as a revenant, your character will be focused wholeheartedly on whatever goal is keeping them going, often to the exclusion of all else. And at the end of all of that, when your goal is achieved, your reward is only a final and irrevocable death. Before we move on with that next resurrection method, there are three little things that I want to point out to you. First is, you can get this guide and all of the other Lunch Break Heroes guides over on Patreon for just as little as a dollar. They're all beautifully typeset and yours to keep forever as soon as you become a patron. The second thing is, we have a Discord server with over a thousand helpful and wonderful people on it. We want you to come and join it, so click the link down in the description and come and hang out with us. The third is, the Deck of Many Quests is available for you to purchase right now in digital and physical form. The physical form isn't going to ship yet until August, September timeframe, but the digital version is ready and waiting for you. You can check out our Indiegogo link down in the description below. Now, speaking of the Deck of Many Quests, I actually just received the production preview of the physical copy. This is what it's going to look like when it arrives from the factory. So it's got a nice little magnetic hinge there. Oh, that, that's sexy. I love that. It's nice and shiny and just beautifully printed. And this is great. If, if you like this, if you think this is good, this is what's going to show up on your doorstep in August, September. So go ahead, check it out, like I said, in the description down below. Next up on our resurrection methods, you can become a blood touched. Bet you've never heard of blood touch before now, though, have you? That's because we made it up. Blood touched sits somewhere between being a vampire spawn and being a dampier. Think of them as vampire light. They've got a fraction of the abilities of the vampire that accidentally turn them, 
and they've got a whole lot of hunger to satisfy. At the very least, they're pretty cool with sunlight, so they've got that going for them, which is good. In order to become a blood touched, you have to have been killed by a vampire. They needn't have drained you completely, but it helps. You also have to have come in contact with a vampire's blood and have it mix with your own. Just a drop is enough to suffice. When you become a blood touched, go ahead and keep all your class, racial, and lineage stuff. There's no changes there. Go ahead and add the following features to your character. Vampiric Constitution. When you make an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you can add your proficiency bonus. But immediately afterwards, you need to make a DC 13 con save. On a failure, you gain a level of exhaustion which can only be removed by feeding. Relentless Hunger. When you finish a long rest, you have to succeed on a DC 13 con save or gain one level of exhaustion that can only be removed by feeding. Draining Bite. Just like a normal vampire, you can make an unarmed melee attack against a grappled humanoid using your strength modifier. On a hit, they take one piercing and 2d4 necrotic damage. You gain half that necrotic damage in temporary hit points, or you can remove one level of exhaustion. The blood touch can be strong and resilient, but all that physical prowess just isn't all it's cracked up to be when compared to the relentless hunger and exhaustion that they experience. They've got to feed on something or someone every day in order to keep up that strength, and the rest of the living world usually isn't cool with that sort of thing. All right, one more small interruption for you. Do you want to win 50 bucks on dmsguild.com? Well, now's your chance. All you have to do is help me get this video to a thousand likes on its first day and comment down below. That's all you have to do to enter. If this video gets a thousand likes in its first 24 hours, I will pick one person from the comments down below and I'll send you 50 bucks on dmsguild.com. So click that like button, leave a comment, and that's it. Let's get this video to a thousand likes. That being said, on with the rest of the video. Next up, you can become a ghost. Not, not everyone wants to pass into the great unknown, especially when that unknown is Ravenloft. Much like revenants, ghosts are kept on this plane of existence by some sort of unfinished business or even a fear of moving on. If your character has any sort of fear of the unknown or the beyond, then they're qualified to come back as a ghost. That fear can drive them to cling to this plane of existence as a shadow of their former selves. So how do you turn your character into a palatably playable poltergeist? Well, first, your creature type has to become undead. Next, you retain all of your class, racial, and lineage features, but you can't use them unless you possess a mortal being. Then, you gain the following features. Deathless nature. You don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. However, your mortal vessels do, so try not to neglect their needs. Possession. As an action, you can take control of a living humanoid. The target has to be willing or fail a saving throw equal to 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier. While in control of the target's body, you can use your class, racial, and lineage features just like you could while you were alive. If your vessel dies with you in it, you reform on that spot within 2d12 hours as a ghost. Spectral nature! <laughs> While not in possession of a body, you're a translucent specter. You can move through other creatures and objects like they're difficult terrain. You can only interact with objects lighter than 10 pounds, and your AC is 10 plus your dexterity modifier. You have resistance to all damage except psychic damage, and you can't take any actions except dash, disengage, dodge, help, and hide. Ghosts are sad creatures. They're stuck in the great in-between. They've been locked out of the afterlife, but they can't truly return to the mortal realm. As a ghost, your character's interactions with the living are extremely limited. In order to really experience things, they have to take possession of another humanoid, which usually that humanoid doesn't like so much. Over time, ghosts just kind of fade away. Year after year, they dwindle, becoming less and less. Eventually, nothing is left of them but a faint echo of a memory. Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft expanded the Keepers of the Feather, a clandestine organization of were-ravens and their BFFs. So we're going to expand them a bit more and make their secret ritual the key to your character's return journey to the land of the living. If your characters helped the Keepers of the Feather in some super significant way, like bringing back winery gems or saving a member of the family or whatnot, then they might be considered for this ritual. 
The Keepers don't like to flaunt their powers at the best of times, so your character needs to be pretty special for the Were Ravens to reveal themselves and basically induct your character into their order. Dare I say, their reputation has to be impeccable. Now, what is this ritual and how does it affect your character? First, the ritual requires three members of the Keepers of the Feather, all Were Ravens. The ritual itself takes eight hours, during which the Were Ravens give up some of their blood and life force and share it with the character to be returned. At the end of the ritual, they cast Reincarnate and bring your character back to life. Now, they don't come back as a Were Raven. The lycanthropic power of the Were Raven's blood was all used up in the ritual. However, they do come back as a Kenku. On the plus side, your Kenku character can turn into a Raven once per long rest using the Druid's Wild Shape rules. Being brought back to life by the Keepers of the Feather definitely leaves its mark, maybe more so than any other method on this list. But if you don't think it's too much of a bird in, then coming back to life like this might not be too unpheasant. Yeah, that's right, I got dad jokes. What's up? Next up, we have Lifted by the Heavens. Maybe. You probably already know that most deities have very little sway in the Domains of Dread. For the most part, a god's devotees are cut off entirely while in the realms of Ravenloft. However, divine influence does leak in every now and then where the Dark Powers will it. And because it's the Dark Powers letting it happen, it's not always for the benefit of the character. Any character that's displayed exceptional devotion to a particular god or creed might rouse the interest of a dark power when they die. And in those cases, they may allow one divine force or another to pass through and intervene with that character. This doesn't necessarily have to be the god or angel thereof that the character follows. It might be one that challenges their beliefs or moral alignment. Not all divinity is good, after all. Such an intervention certainly won't happen out of pure altruism, though. There's going to be a cost, and the trade has to be fair. Now, it's going to be their life for something of equal value. So what happens to your character when some divine force intervenes in their death? Usually, the force that's intervening will present themselves to the character in a way that's familiar and comfortable. Someone that they knew in life, perhaps, or as some iconography from their faith. Because the trade of returning the character to life needs to be fair, a deal will be proposed. I suggest that you make this something that's specific to your campaign or the character, but here's a few ideas for you. A cleric can be asked to shift allegiance to a different god, perhaps one that's of a different alignment. The paladin can be asked to forsake their oath, thereby becoming an oathbreaker. Not necessarily evil, however. The character has to take a level in Celestial Warlock, thereby making the deity their patron. It could also be something completely nebulous, like, you know, they owe the deity a favor somewhere down the line. That keeps the door open for you to think of something later that's going to be really impactful to the story. Maybe the character is asked to betray the party entirely, and if they did so, it would cause a TPK in the end of the game, and then they have to rebel against their deity and risk their life in the process, and oh my god, that's such, oh, I want to do that in my game. Like I said, the Dark Powers don't let divinity into their domains for no reason. They're screening every call and they're only letting in what's going to amuse them or what's going to help you create the best story. Whoever or whatever decides to come through and help your character, I can guarantee it's going to turn your fate on its head. What creative ways have you come up with to bring a character back from the dead? Tell me all about it in the comments down below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel and press that like button down there. Now, keep on living, and I'll see you next time.